Welcome back to the Timeless Watch channel, guys. It's hard to believe it's been a year since I first said those words, or at least since you guys first heard me say them. Yes, the channel is one year old. This time last year, I posted my first video, the Yachtmaster Rhodium, the 40 mil. Still one of my favorite watches, the first Rolex I ever purchased. I had to convince them in the AD to sell it to me. It was my first encounter with that nonsense. So I figured it'd be appropriate to uh, do another Yachtmaster now that the channel is a year is a year old. So I'm wearing the Yachtmaster 40 bit in rose gold on the Oyster Flex bracelet. Look at that. It is a bracelet, it's not a band. I know some of you are saying, no, it's a rubber band, not a rubber bracelet, but it actually has titanium strips on the inside, which help it keep its form, maintain its form, whether you're swimming or whatever you're doing, no matter how much you use it. So it is technically a bracelet, kind of covered in, in rubber. Very fancy version, of course. Rolex have to do things that way. They did the same as well with, with the rose gold. I should say Ever Rose, because that's what they call it. I think the name Ever Rose comes from, it's like a portmanteau between Forever and Rose. And I think what they're alluding to there is the, uh, the fact that there's platinum in the mix. Normally rose gold is 750 gold, which is 18 carat, and a little copper, which gives it that rusty red hue to it. But gold does change color with time. What they've done on this one is they've added a little bit of platinum in there, which gives it a little extra sparkle, lightens up the roseness of it. It's not too dark. And apparently the platinum will prevent the gold from aging, from losing its, its original tone of, of rose. So it's forever going to be the same tone. Ever rose. Very nice, very clever. So one thing I wanted to do in this um, episode is just go around. A lot of you guys were saying you liked me walking around Venice just doing my regular stuff. So I'm gonna do that. I figured it's the Yacht Master and there are plenty of yachts and beautiful boats around here. So I may as well stay put in my new home city now uh, as of about six months ago. Give you guys a little bit of a walk about and i would like to also discuss the youtube thing a little bit just to tell you how my first year went and the kind of things to expect if you're considering starting your own channel so let's have a wander around venice i'll show you a few spots a few interesting places and of course let's look at the beautiful yacht master 116655 and rose gold on that oyster flex let's do it
these students back here are sketching is the Redentore uh, church right across there on the island of Judeca. It was erected in 1580 to celebrate the ending of a very serious plague here in the city that wiped out nearly 40% of their population. They celebrate it once a year still to this day. As part of the celebration, they build a pontoon bridge right behind me there going across to the church. So for only two days a year, you can actually walk from Venice over to the island of Judeca without getting your feet wet. Normally it's uh, only accessible by boat. It's a very beautiful church designed by Andrea Palladio, a guy who keeps coming up for some reason on this channel. And uh, it's quite stunning on the other side uh, of the water. It's very regal and very magnificent site on the other side there. The second one they built is a lot more famous. This one right behind me, the Madonna della Salute, erected around uh, 1630 in celebration for the second plague moving on. Both times the plague knocked out about a third of their population here in the city. So very dark times indeed, at a very significant moment in Venice when they finally returned to the norm. They named it after Madonna della Salute, the mother of health, Lady Mary basically. And of course Salute means good health. That's where the terminology to salute someone comes from. You wish them good health, you know, pass a guy in the street, tip your hat and say, I wish you good health, sir. That's where it comes from. It's one of the most famous uh, buildings in all of Venice. If you pick up any postcard or Google any image of Venice, you'll probably see its famous domes somewhere in the picture, maybe distant background or right in the foreground. It's, uh, it's one of the most famous buildings in the whole city. One of my favorite things about the design is how they used perspective with the statues. If you look at this statue here, it's closer to you than the one behind it, but they kind of go in a line. So as you pass by on a boat, if you're on the, the Bateo, the Vaporetto, one of those uh, regular buses as it glides on, cruises on by, if you look at the statues, they kind of do this 3D effect thing because they kind of move past each other like this. The way they're all lined out in perspective like that makes them all almost look like they're flying or they're moving as they watch you go by. It's really, it's a really cool effect. So the original Yacht Master in 92 was a flop. Nobody was interested in it. They didn't really know what it was. It was not a Submariner, it wasn't a replacement for the Submariner at all. It was a different kind of watch and made a slightly different statement. Submariner has a kind of a beefy masculine uh, name to it. If you're a Submariner kind of guy, you're a tough guy who wanders uh, around uh, diving and stuff like that. Um, Yacht Master is a little softer, isn't it? It's kind of the wealthy young man on his yacht. It's uh, there's something about that that doesn't ring as well as Submariner, right? Even when they updated it and improved it and made the dial fully platinum and all of that stuff uh, back at the end of the 90s, it was still not working. The model kind of languished and, and, and rotted in the corner of the Rolex catalog then for a good 15 years. Then in 2015, the weirdest thing happened. Rolex brought out this watch and it sported some really new things that Rolex weren't doing up until then. First of all, it was fully rose gold. That was an unusual thing. It had a ceramic insert in the bezel. It's a very new thing for them. Uh, they were already doing it in uh, some of their other sports models, but not like this one. Uh, it's a very kind of different looking uh, insert completely with its kind of sandblasted base and then those glossy raised numerals. But probably most significant of all was the bracelet, the, uh, the rubber band. That was a super new thing for them. Rubber bands were only beginning to catch on. Now they're on pretty much every watch you can find. Uh, but at the time they were a fairly new idea and Rolex didn't have one yet. I think a lot of people were kind of shocked at uh, how new it was. And it was actually a projection of the future of things to come in, in the Rolex catalog. Now you can get a Daytona on the Oyster Flex in rose gold. You can get, uh, they recently released the uh, Sky Dwellers on the Oyster Flex. So it was, it was coming. This was just a sign 
of the shape of things to come. But this was the very first one. It was all by itself in the catalog with this funny uh, rubber band on it. <laughs> it's hard to know who exactly they were aiming at. I mean, it's a very expensive watch. It's all precious metal, but it has a rubber band, which is clearly a sporty kind of thing. But a lot of watches were already moving in that direction. Audemars Piguet were putting a lot of their watches on rubber bands. A rubber band obviously is is the most durable kind of, of, of strap you can use. It's gonna fare fine in water and you can sweat into it and clean it off and so on. Uh, obviously it's not gonna break apart if it's a good quality rubber band. So it is the kind of uh, all-purpose sort of strap to use. I don't know if it's the most attractive one. I'm not crazy about these things. This one I'll make an exception to because it is, it feels beautifully designed. It has these little rubber fins on the inside to kind of pad against your, your wrist and create a small distance between your skin and the, uh, and the band itself. So it doesn't end up irritating your skin and you don't sweat too much under it. It's also got those titanium plates in there so it holds its form uh, better than other uh, bands, assumably. Headed away from the kind of touristy, flamboyant Venice over to somewhere that's a bit more rough and ready and uh, true to to the real Venetian style. Going over to a place called Dos Bad, it means two swords. It's a well-known Chiquetti place. Very small, very tight, very packed and uh, <clears throat> very good food I have to say for a Saturday not very packed Venice I mean clearly for the obvious reasons very little tourism but the tourism has been picking up in the past while no Americans no, uh, no one from the Far East obviously but uh, a lot of Germans I recently learned that Angela Merkel told her people if they need to go on holiday, go to Italy because Italy have responded best to the current crisis. So if you need, if you must leave and must go on a little holiday, go to Italy and God damn her for saying that. It's just full of Germans everywhere. Nothing against Germany or anything, but it's weird hearing German everywhere I go. It's almost like a breath of fresh air to hear an Italian. That's pretty weird. But I'm actually headed away from the tourist area here. My, well, let me take that back immediately. I'm actually going through the worst tourist area right here, which is Rialto. Let me show you the bridge. That's the Rialto bridge over there. It's a monster. I'm going to cross that in a second. And this area has just got all the cheesy, tacky restaurants, pizzerias and so on. And uh, that was French, by the way. I'm not going to complain about that. This is kind of where all the cool bars are, late night bars and so on. And I love this little uh, tiny pier here just going out along the side. In the evening you see a lot of youngsters sitting out there with their bottles of beer and bottles of wine all along the edge here. I saw one guy get so drunk he fell in one time everybody had to drag him out. <laughs>
years, uh, Dos Padre experience was unforgettable. Incredible chiquetti, like the food, super high level. A lot of the chiquetti are just little bread things with a piece of salmon or tuna on them. This is like top level, and you can understand why there's a big crowd outside waiting to get in. No wonder they're all alcoholics in this town because they're all standing on the streets throwing back their food. I got a bottle of wine, I must have finished it in like 12 minutes flat. So when I started the channel, you know, I was a little hesitant about it at first. I didn't know if it was my thing or not. Uh, and my band had predated the YouTube explosion completely, just by a couple of years. But you know, had the band existed more recently, we'd have w way more views probably. But the band split up before YouTube really started gaining momentum. So I didn't really know the YouTube thing very much. So I started uh, looking up, doing some research, you know, on he's playing Turando, right? Nessun Dorma from Turando, which is going to have a big crescendo, and I now have to stop talking because it's going to get very loud. All right. So I started looking around for videos that were, you know, giving advice about uh, whether you should start a, a YouTube channel or not and what to expect if you do. And one of them was, was Guy. It was a watch channel, Guy on um, Just Blue Fish Watch. Is that the name of the channel? Great guy, great channel, smart guy. And uh, he had a video all about it. And honestly, if I took his advice, I probably never would have started it because he was rather grim about how cruel people can be in their comments and critical and so on. Here comes our crescendo soon. Uh, he wasn't too bad. He, he has a very realistic way of framing things, phrasing things, and uh, I appreciated that. I love... Uh, Intro. Here we go. Intro. I often see that commercial for Vincero watches. You guys ever see that one? Which would be Vincero. I will win. Vincero. <laughs> They're putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Big applause for that one. The truth is, if you if you make a channel, I'll tell you my experience. Maybe I'm it's the observation selection effect in effect. But my experience was people were very encouraging and very kind and really, really had nice things to say. There was very few with nasty things to say. Very few. I was surprised. I was expecting all sorts of hatred and, oh, you don't know what you're talking about and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they come along, but for the most part, it's, I mean, that's 1% of the, of the people. It's not even worth mentioning or thinking about. So I would say if you want to start a channel, don't, don't be afraid. Just get, get straight into it. 
people are gonna people are gonna love it, you know. And try to focus on the folks that do like it and not on the folks that don't, because one of the things I noticed as well in the music business is the same thing. You get ten good reviews and then you get one bad one and it's the one bad one that brings everyone to a halt. It's like Christ guys. If you're getting mostly bad reviews of bad write-ups and, and criticism, okay, then maybe it's time to worry. But even then, it's probably not. You know, just do what you want to do, you know. Don't listen to the naysayers, as they say. But I have a feeling that people on YouTube, and definitely in the music industry as well, my experience was, yeah, they get all these compliments, but the compliments had that much gravity to them. Small, pieces of weight whereas a negative comment like a, a criticism or an insult it's like that much it just it would incapacitate some people all they could think about was the was the criticism I think the reason why is because people have an insecurity they're already critiquing themselves on the inside so if you come along and add to that, it's like you're confirming all their fears, you know. So I see that on YouTube, people getting 20 compliments and then one, one critique or one insult and just focusing on that, which is something I, I don't do. I put some people in their place when they're talking shit, you know. But uh, that's just because I like to slap people on the hand sometimes for being idiots. <laughs> One thing I did want to clarify for some of you guys, because I know it's gonna, I'm gonna get it in the comments again and I'll have to mention it. You see a lot of my photography of these watches. The watch is sitting on concrete. And of course, everyone's saying, oh my God, you're gonna scratch the watch. You're gonna ding the watch. So I'm gonna let you in on a little timeless watch channel secret. If you look carefully there, I have a thin layer of tape, of sticky tape that I've cut to the shape of the side of the watch. Sometimes it takes me like a whole 10 seconds just to place it down. And the uh, tape just prevents it from those little light scuffs that can happen on, uh, on a hard surface or a, a rough surface like these uh, beautiful brick surfaces all around me here. So let that put that to rest hopefully those of you who are terrified of it falling off an edge and into nearby water and so on trust me i have the same fear <laughs> one thing i did as well to celebrate the uh, the birthday of the channel was i went back to my very first lens this is the lens i used on all the early videos it's kind of the wrong lens it's a wide angle lens as you can see it's getting the full you know normally lenses are a bit more like that but uh, this one goes like that and you can see in both directions almost and also things look a little bit weird when they get to the edge if my head goes this way it kind of gets stretched it's not a vlogging lens at all guys I don't know what I was thinking it's great for panoramas so it worked well with the you know the watch and the church in the background or whatever but for just doing this stuff, I'm like, it looks like I'm going back 10 feet right now every time I move. <laughs> but I figured I'd put it back on just for uh, shits and giggles. place behind me is a gondola repair shop it's like seeing a garage you know where they repair cars but uh, for gondolas <laughs> it's pretty cool there's one place I wanted to show you guys actually this place is a hotel just check this shit out look at that building look at that thing some nice glass I was looking for a nice one for my brand new table I got in the 
the apartment. I got a monster oak table in the apartment. Bloody thing was 300 pounds, 350. It took five guys to bring it in. But I need a nice piece of Murano glass, you know, like a big vase or something and it has a centerpiece in that thing. I love this little square. You'll notice as well, all the squares have a well. You know, this is a particularly big one. But every little square here has a well in it, which are all closed up now, of course, because we have running water in our homes. But centuries ago, that was probably like like seeing a candy store for people like that well was probably like the center of attention for everyone in this in this square because it was fresh water you know cool water you can imagine the height of uh, summer people gathered around that well you know trying to cool off this is a lovely spot here not far from my place now uh, that's the Academia Bridge over there. There's a famous photo when George Clooney got married to Amal. Is that her name? They came, they got married here and they came up, up the Grand Canal in their boat. And all these famous photos and footage was taken from the Academia Bridge looking down. So if you see any of those famous photos of him just married, wearing his uh, Deville, actually. I think he had a white gold Omega Deville on. Of course, he's Omega ambassador. Always wears Omega. Never seen him wear anything else. But isn't this a beautiful spot? Like just across here, this is on the Grand Canal. I mean, if there's anywhere expensive to live, I live in a pretty expensive area, but What's more expensive is being on the canal. If you have a view like those guys up there, a beautiful view down onto the canal, that's that's the big bucks right there. Here's a cool thing as well. I love this. You see this a lot. I mean, that bridge, not the farther one, which is the one I just came over, but this bridge right here just leads to that house. <laughs> that's it. It's not a bridge to another street. It's just a bridge in, in there. So these people who live in this building, whoever they are, I don't know if it's one person who owns the whole palazzo. That's likely, by the way, old money. Or if it's apartments, they have a little bridge to cross just for their own house, their own, their own bridge dedicated to their own building. Isn't that nuts? So it's off to Corner Pub. I'm sure they're open. Scavi aren't, because it's Sunday. Oh yeah, this is the most mini chapel you've ever seen when you see this thing. <laughs> right here, squeezed in between these two buildings. Look at that chapel. Tiny little thing. <laughs> yep, corner pub is open. I can see it from here. Wonderful. Yeah, I got something a little harder tonight than last night. Uh, this is a Negroni. Cheers, guys. Nice. On the steps of the bridge.
well, I'd been warned about it many times, but it looks like it finally arrived, the famous Caigo, the Venetian fog. And I think I get it now. This isn't a regular fog at all. It changes the face of the city completely and adds a certain magic to it that isn't there when it's blue skies. I was wondering as well when I'd pass little galleries here and look in and see paintings of Venice by local artists, about 80% of them are during the cold months. You just see mist everywhere and buildings coming out of what well, seems like nothing. It's, it's, it's a totally different, uh, an alternative Venice that you don't really think of, you don't see on the postcards. But uh, I can see why the artists are in love with the city during, during these months. I think the Yacht Master 40 is one of the most beautiful watches in the entire catalog. And it's not lost on me that for every model they have, there's also a women's size. I'm fond of the idea of his and hers watches. I think it's very cute to put on the same watch on your way out together and things like that, or just knowing your significant other has the same watch on that you have. But I wonder, is Rolex getting a little sentimental on us? Maybe a little romantic? and. It also resembles a ring in ways with that oyster flex like this and the, the beautiful jewel, the ever rose jewel sitting on the top. It's a watch that a couple could wear every day, work, play, doesn't matter because it's tough and sporty, but it's also a piece of beautiful jewelry that could be a nice uh, representation of, of the one you love. Maybe this is their answer to matching wedding bands. If it is, I think they're on the right track with that. I think it's a beautiful idea and it's a beautiful watch overall. And maybe they're hoping that couples will buy this watch together in 40 and 37 millimeters. I hope you enjoyed a little walk around my new hometown here. Thanks again for watching and happy birthday to the Timeless Watch channel. I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.